Today, I'll be talking about one aspect of a product we have launched called CarrierSeq. This product relates to carrier screening research. Carrier screening research is about discovering the risks of inheriting genetic disorders. Usually what's of interest are early onset, severe genetic disorders with recessive forms of inheritance. Expanded screening research is testing broadly for many disorders all at once. Large panels are starting to be used for research because they improve discovery rates. Typically, people don't have a great understanding of their family history or even their ethnicity, and so important variants can be missed if you limit an assay based on these attributes. Publications show that limiting assays for a selected subset of disorders can miss up to 70% of carriers. The cumulative risk of these disorders is estimated to be 1 in 300 births. That's a higher rate than Down syndrome at 1 in 800 births. The product CarrierSeq aims to discover carrier status regardless of ancestry or geographical region. It does this in three ways. First, it's a broad panel that increases detection rates by addressing 418 inherited disorders and more than 28,000 variants. These include single nucleotide variants, indels, and copy number variants. CarrierSeq utilizes next generation sequencing, or MGS, to detect these. The focus of this talk will be on the second point. This panel aims to consolidate what are frequently separate, standalone assays by including difficult targets in highly homologous genes like SMN1 and 2 for spinal muscular atrophy and HBA1 and 2 for alpha thalassemia. Finally, the end-to-end -end workflow includes software developed to simplify identification and annotation of variants so that the results from a large screen of a huge number of variants don't become overwhelming for the end user. One important inherited disease that is a challenge for expanded carrier screening is spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA. SMA results in weakness and wasting of the muscles and is the leading genetic cause of infant death, affecting one in 6,000 to 10,000 births. The disease can have varied pathologies ranging from neonatal death in SMA type 0 to adult muscle weakness and fatigue in SMA type 4. SMA is caused by a defect in the SMN1 gene. SMN protein is essential for the survival of motor neurons. Without the protein, muscles do not develop or function properly due to the death of motor neuron cells in the anterior horn of the spinal cord and the brain. This leads to atrophy of the muscles. Individuals can be carriers for SMA without showing any symptoms of the disease. Carriers are very common, about 1 in 50 people, and found among all ethnicities. If two carriers have a child together, there's a 25% chance that the child will inherit both defective SMN1 chromosomes and be afflicted with SMA. The SMN1 gene is located on chromosome 5. There is another gene located in the same region called SMN2. SMN1 and 2 are very similar in sequence but contribute much differently to motor neuron survival. SMN1 makes most of the protein necessary for proper motor function, while SMN2 mainly produces an inactive truncated protein. The functional difference between the two is a single nucleotide change, a C to T polymorphism in exon 7. Changes in SMN2 did not cause SMA, but SMN2 could reduce the severity of the disease through the small amount of functional protein it produces. The more copies of SMN2 a person with SMA has, the better the survivability and the muscle function. The most common defects leading to SMA carrier status are complete or partial loss of a copy of SMN1. In a normal individual, shown at the top right, the chromosome inherited from each parent has a single SMN1 copy and a single SMN2 copy, meaning the person has two copies of each gene in total. An individual with fewer than two SMN1 copies is a carrier, while someone with two or more SMN1 copies is usually not a carrier. About 95% of defects in the SMN1 gene are one of three types, 
a complete deletion of the gene shown second from the top, a deletion of exon 7 of the gene in the third diagram, or a gene conversion as shown at the bottom. A gene conversion is when a piece of the SMN1 gene locus is replaced with the homologous portion of SMN2. In particular, the distinguishing base in exon 7 becomes a C instead of a T. This is often accompanied by other changes in intron 7 and non-coding exon 8, which make SMN1 more closely resemble SMN2. Carrier screening for SMN1 is also complicated by the high similarity between SMN1 and 2, because we need to be able to tell the two genes apart to properly describe the variants affecting them. An additional challenge for carrier screening research on SMA is the rare occurrence of silent carriers who can be incorrectly identified as non-carriers. Working from left to right in the figure, a normal person has two copies of SMN1 shown in red. A carrier typically has one copy of SMN1 missing or defective. While we know that a gene conversion of SMN1 to 2 results in a loss of a functional SMN1 copy, the opposite, a conversion of SMN2 to 1, as shown in the third diagram, can later disguise a person's carrier status. Conversion of SMN2 to 1 creates three copies of SMN1 in an individual. That person is not a carrier, but if the two-copy chromosome is inherited from one parent and an SMN1 deletion is inherited from the other parent, a silent carrier is created, as shown in the rightmost diagram. Silent carriers have two copies of SMN1, so they appear normal in genetic tests, but they have a 50% chance of contributing the zero-copy chromosome to each of their children. The goal of creating carrier seq was to incorporate challenging genes into an NGS assay through a combination of precise targeting and algorithm development. As I mentioned, high degrees of homology between parologous genes or between genes and their pseudogenes is a challenge for sequencing approaches, particularly short read NGS technology. Carrier seq uses a combination of small sequence variant and copy number variant information to identify functional copy number and gene conversion events for these challenging cases. For SMA, which is the focus of this talk, the number of copies of both SMN1 and SMN2 are determined. For alpha thalassemia, deletions affecting HBA1, HBA2, or larger segments, including both genes, are distinguished. For genes with closely related pseudogene copies, such as, as GBA and CYP21A2, special algorithms are used to identify whether crippling variants fall in the gene or pseudogene locus. A key strength of the CarrierSeq product is its use of AmpliSeq technology, which enables multiplexing of many thousands of amplicons in a single library. For CarrierSeq, the primer pairs were carefully designed and verified for performance and specificity. That design includes unique amplicon targeting and curation to fix false priming issues, extra amplicons flanking coding regions that help distinguish common deletion types, and empirical verification of the primer performance on hundreds of samples. Copy number variants are detected using a global CNV algorithm applied to all 420 genes. The algorithm dynamically calls deletion and duplication breakpoints, in some cases down to individual exons. For SMA, copy number is calculated across the shared and unique portions of SMN1 and 2 to determine a final functional copy number for each. The combination of SMV, indel, and copy number variations involved in SMA are displayed in carrier reporter software and annotated with significance information from ClinVar. Let's look in more detail at how this works for SMA using the example of two samples from the Coriel Institute. CarrierSeq targets the full coding regions of each gene with 29 primer pairs. Because the genes are virtually identical in exons 1 to 6, the primers amplify for both targets equally. In the top example, after normalization of amplicon representation to an in silico copy number baseline, the majority of amplicons are at or near copy number 2, meaning that there are a total of four copies of the SMN1 and 2 genes. We need to look to the data from exon 7, intron 7, and exon 8 to 
to determine how these copies are distributed between the two loci. In the first case on top, data from the distinguishing amplicons shown inside the red boxes indicate that two copies of SMN1 are present as depicted by the red circles. The blue triangles in these regions reveal that there are no copies of SMN2. Notice that for the two amplicons between the red boxes, the average copy number of both SMN genes has dropped to one. From these results, the software can determine that there are two copies of each gene, but that SMN2 has a deletion of exon 7 and 8. This sample is not a carrier for SMA because SMN2 is not a significant contributor to the disease. In the second example, copy number across the amplicons common between the two genes is actually hovering around one and a half, meaning that there are three total gene copies split between the two loci. Once again, the distinguishing amplicons in the red boxes allow the algorithm to determine where these copies come from. We can see that SMN2 is present in two copies, but SMN1 is hemizygous. The sample is a carrier for SMA because only one copy of SMN1 is present. So we talked about silent carriers earlier. How can we tell if a person is a silent carrier where two copies of SMN1 are both found in cis on the same chromosome? This is, of course, not easy to do outright, but in some populations, silent carrier status is in linkage disequilibrium with a variant in SMN1 in tron 7. This variant has no known effect by itself, but it indicates an elevated risk that the same chromosome has two SMN1 copies. A person with the SNP present and two copies of SMN1 is more likely to be a silent carrier than if the SNP is absent. Carrier Reporter is a specifically designed software package that quickly translates variant calls from the assays into reports with automatic variant classification. The genetic results for each sample are presented according to risk category. In this case, we see that this, the sample carries the SNP in SMN1 associated with silent carrier status. Clicking on the variant reveals detailed information, such as alternative names, the genomic location, and the affected amino acid. In this case, the variant is intronic, so that, that information is left blank. The curated significance of this variant, which is customizable by the user, is shown as benign in blue in the middle. However, there is also an indication near the bottom in gold that this variant represents a risk factor. Clicking on the purple button at the very bottom pops up a list of finding QC metrics, such as the detected allele frequency and read depth information that underlie the finding. These tables show data from studies we performed with Coriel samples. In the upper left, we report the accuracy of calling SMN1 and SMN2 functional copy numbers in 91 samples. Accuracy was 97.8% for SMN1 and 95.6% for SMN2. In the upper right, we see how those results break down for detection of carrier status for SMN1. 100% of carriers were identified and only one false positive was produced, resulting in a specificity of 98.9%. In addition to the common copy number changes affecting the SMN1 locus, the bottom table shows that our panel also detects non-copy number variations. We have successfully detected three pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants, as well as the silent carrier associated SNP and a co-segregating indel in non-coding exon 8. In summary, I've described an end-to-end -end solution for expanded carrier screening research using the Ion CarrierSeq panel and Carrier Reporter software. The panel surveys 420 genes, which means we improve detection of carrier status in samples with no or unclear family history. The benefit of this is an increased confidence in the accuracy of the determination. Included in our targets are several which are traditionally difficult to work with for next-generation sequencing. This enables researchers to consolidate those individual gene assays into one panel that broadly covers variants for hundreds of inherited disorders. The benefit of this is higher efficiencies for labs performing these tests. 
Finally, the whole system is optimized to work together from library preparation to reporting software that enables labs not otherwise specialized in NGS to run the assay and interpret the results. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me today. So let's start the Q&A. Uh, the first question, um, so you talked about gene conversions being one of the causes of loss of SMN1. How does that work? Well, the short answer is we don't really know how it works because while the mechanisms of gene conversion have been studied in other organisms like yeast, they're not really well understood in mammals. But we do know that the gene conversion does happen. And the evidence for this is that whole blocks of sequences normally associated with one gene, like SMN2, show up at the other gene locus. So the conversions don't look just like a single variant that could be a, due to a point mutation. They're detected as segments of SMVs and indels that look like they were transferred over altogether. And we see the reciprocal changes as well, which is another indication that gene conversion is happening. For example, the SMN2 locus can come to look like SMN1, or the GBA pseudogene can take on sequences from the gene locus. Although we don't really understand the mechanism, the evidence suggests that gene conversion is pretty common. Genes with high levels of homology, like SMN1 and 2, are linked with higher rates of mutations, such as full or partial copy limit losses or gene conversion events. This may be the reason why SMA is seen across all ethnicities, because deletions and conversions have happened spontaneously many times in people due to the propensity for errors during replication or recombination. And you mentioned that SMN2 variants don't cause spinal muscular atrophy. So why does the panel report SMN2 copy number? Well, it's important to monitor and report SMN2 for a couple of reasons. First, although SMN2 copy loss doesn't cause SMA, some researchers want to understand SMN2 copy status because it has implications on the severity of the disease. For example, having four or more SMN2 copies can result in less severe type 4 SMA, while having just one copy produces severe type 0 disease. So knowing the SMN2 copy number can help researchers to understand the patterns of disease that they see in a particular pedigree. And the second reason is that because of the high homology between SMN2 and SMN1, we really need to understand what's going on at both loci. For example, in samples which have the silent carrier SNP indicating two copies of SMN1 may be carried in cysts, we have also seen a correlated loss of one copy of SMN2. That is strongly suggestive of SMN2 to 1 gene conversion happening in those samples. So having the SMN2 copy number is giving additional information that adds another piece to the puzzle of what may be going on in that particular sample. Okay, uh, we're going to wrap it up there. We'd like to thank our panelists, Adam Harris, and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thank you all for joining us for this session.